Well, you saw a little bit of it yesterday with the debate. Two months from now, Americans will vote in an election that will decide whether the White House stays in the hands of the current administration or will change hands, and whether Congress uh, will remain as it is. Perhaps uh, it, will, it will change as well. The Jewish community will take particular interest as so many of our public policy priorities, both international and domestic, hang in the balance. These challenges are at once numerous and diverse, complex and profound, and they will shape the direction of our community and the future of our world for decades to come. It's not an overstatement, I think it's true. And none of these issues are more urgent than the threat posed by Iran's unstinting quest to acquire nuclear weapons. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad has publicly denied the Holocaust, promised to eradicate Israel, supported terrorism, and suppressed human rights. And in his latest verbal onslaught against the Jewish state, he last month referred to Israel as an insult to humanity. But Iran's nuclear ambitions have been well documented by the United Nations Security Council and by the UN's watchdog, the International Atomic Energy Agency. The Iranian threat chillingly echoes the dangers posed by Nazi Germany in the 1930s. In that era, History taught us that when an enemy threatens to destroy you, you cannot afford to simply disbelieve it, or ignore it, or hope for the best, or hope that it goes away. International efforts to stop Iran's nuclear ambitions through sanctions and diplomacy grew more complicated a couple of weeks ago when the 120-nation non-aligned movement used the occasion of a summit in Tehran to hand its Iranian host a major diplomatic victory. The Iranians now will become the new chair of the non-aligned movement for the next three years. In what has become known as the Tehran Declaration, the NAM as it is called, unanimously decreed its support for Iran's nuclear energy program and criticized the US-led attempt to isolate and punish Iran with economic sanctions. This was the strongest expression for support yet for Iran in its confrontation with the West over its nuclear program. Coming as it did amidst the largest international gathering in Iran since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. By strengthening its ties in Latin America, Iran is seeking to escape international sanctions, gather support for its nuclear proliferation program, diminish U.S. relevance in the region, and create a terror network capable of targeting American, Israeli, or Jewish interests. This came into focus last week when Israeli radio reported that Iran has established a training base in northern Nicaragua, near the border with Honduras, that is used by Hezbollah. Approximately 30 members of the terrorist organization reside inside the area, which has been closed to locals. The Hezbollah terrorists reportedly receive all their supplies from Tehran. Sources gather that the trainees are preparing for retaliatory attacks against U.S. and Israeli targets in the event of a nuclear, of a military strike on Iran's nuclear facilities. The Iranian regime has publicly stated that cultivating stronger relations with Latin American countries is one of its top foreign policy priorities. Iran has even launched a Spanish language TV channel called Hispan TV. The outlet, which is operated by Iran's state-owned public broadcasting corporation, is used as a propaganda machine to promote the regime's anti-American and anti-Semitic ideology throughout the region. At the United Nations, a steady drumbeat of anti-Israel pro-Palestinian resolutions at the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council in Geneva continues. Also ongoing is the effort by Palestinians to gain admission to UN agencies around the world, thereby circumventing the peace process and vindicating their refusal to negotiate directly with the Israelis. And meanwhile, the ironically named World Conference Against Racism and its two successor gatherings under UN auspices have demonstrated that even a cause as noble as fighting racism and discrimination can be hijacked by countries whose primary purpose is not to safeguard the freedoms and human rights for which they hold little regard. Rather, their purpose is to spread, in the name of the United Nations, anti-Semitism anti and hatred of Israel. Despite the injustice, uh, the injustice and absurdity of the world's characterization of the Jewish state and its actions, Israel has, in fact, made every possible overture to the Palestinians. It has taken the risk of removing roadblocks in many places in the West Bank. 
It has dramatically eased its restrictions on the passage of cargo into Hamas-controlled Gaza. It has upheld the rights and privileges, in quotes, of terrorists in its jails, even as one of its young servicemen was held in vicious captivity. Israel ultimately agreed to release over 1,000 Palestinian prisoners, including convicted murderers, in return for Gilad Shalit, something perhaps no other country would do. <clears throat> Israel stands accused, and the Palestinians sought to have the Security Council formalize the placement of this issue atop the hierarchy of regional misdeeds, of presenting the greatest obstacle to peace in the form of settlement building. Whatever you may think about the settlement issue, it was none other than Ariel Sharon who unconditionally withdrew every settlement from the Gaza Strip, eliciting only endless rocket attacks in return. And by the way, by the way, since January 1st of this year, 455 rockets have been fired into Israel. There are a lot of countries that are represented here, in Europe and Latin America, in addition to the United States. What country would stand for one rocket to be fired across the border, much less 455 rockets? Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas has been candid about his intentions, spelling them out unambiguously in an op-ed in the New York Times. He wrote that Palestine's admission to the United Nations, quote, would pave the way for the internationalization of the conflict as a legal matter, not just a political one. And he went on to say that it would also pave the way for us to pursue claims against Israel at the United Nations, human uh, rights treaty bodies, and at the international court of justice. So he's saying exactly what they want to do. They're not telegraphing it in some ambiguous way. He's saying exactly in, in the New York Times. Thus, the widely lauded moderate of Palestinian politics, the man who was no more willing to entertain a sweeping peace offer by Ehud Olmert in 2008 than Yasser Arafat was in receiving Ehud Barak's proposal in 2000, has laid down his mark. The Palestinians' primary commitment, all empty assurances aside, is not the hard work of peacemaking, but the old game of isolating and stigmatizing Israel. As Prime Minister Netanyahu said at the UN last fall, just an hour after Abbas made his official application for UN membership, Israel wants peace with the Palestinian state, but the Palestinians want a state without peace. Sadly, even in his General Assembly speech last September, Abbas could only bring himself to recognize Muslim and Christian ties to the Holy Land, not mentioning Jewish. And we know all too well his refusal to accept Israel as a Jewish state, a designation established at the very UN partition plan in 1947 in that resolution that Abbas now invokes 65 years later. Make no mistake, with Hamas controlling Gaza, and vile incitement against an existing UN member state saturating its own school textbooks and media. The PA neither is currently qualified for, nor does it most need, member state standing at the UN. What it does most need is to further expand its unprecedented progress in bettering the conditions of its people in recent years by enhancing, and not undermining, cooperation with Israel. Indeed, the only likely beneficiary of Mahmoud Abbas's march away from progress is the fanatical regime in Tehran, along with its terrorist proxies. Committed as ever to preventing peace, Iran is desperate for international distraction as it races to complete an illicit nuclear program that has been decisively unmasked by the International Atomic Energy Agency. So whether in confronting member states lending a hand to Palestinian circumvention and deferral of a peace process, or in continuously refocusing global attention on Iranian policies that match the regime's open and very dangerous rhetoric, B'nai B'rith will continue to remain in the forefront of defending Israel on diplomatic uh, <coughs> battlefields in any venue. No greater challenge faces the Jewish people today than the demonization and delegitimization of Israel aimed at relegating the Jewish state to pariah status in the world. Just as Jews have suffered from anti-Semitism for thousands of years, Israel today, it has been said, is the Jew among nations. In what have become increasingly daily occurrences, Israel's enemies repeatedly accuse it of being a Nazi-like occupier, an apartheid state that disenfranchises the Palestinians. Israel's attempts to defend itself from terrorist attacks are routinely condemned by the international community. Falsehoods about the Jewish state are repeated so often that they become widely accepted in popular culture. Such manifestations of blatant 
anti-Israel sentiment go far beyond mere policy criticism of the Jewish state. Rather, they demonstrate a willingness to vilify Israel and apply double standards to it, to condemn the Jewish state for actions for which no other country in the world would receive similar criticism. Demonization, delegitimization, and a double standard, what Natan Sharansky calls the three Ds of anti-Israel criticism, are an evidence in many parts of the world, often merging with traditional anti-Semitic motifs, which are now employed in the service of an anti-Israel message. This is a common practice of anti-Israel journalists and editorial cartoonists in Europe and the Middle East who often borrow the symbols and motifs from Nazi propaganda so as to evoke the virulent anti-Semitism of Der Sturmer. Thus one sees images of Jews as ghoulish, satanic creatures with misshapen noses festooned with dollar signs or carrying money bags and of Israelis bearing swastikas or drinking the blood of children. All of these developments are occurring at a time when Israel's neighborhood is facing a period of tremendous upheaval and uncertainty represented by the Arab Spring. For Israel, which has long relied on peace treaties, deterrence, a qualitative military edge, trade ties, and strategic partnerships to offset its international isolation, the security picture has changed considerably. And compromised is the bedrock understanding of the crucial importance of Israel's existence as some critics of the Jewish state have asserted that Israel's very right to exist must be put into question as a result of its policies. To be sure, no other state in the world, whether democracy or dictatorship, would ever have its right of sovereignty challenged on the grounds of a policy or an action. But Israel's is. At a time when Jewish prosperity and Jewish integration into Western society have reached unprecedented levels, the challenges facing the Jewish world remain significant. It has been 12 years since the outbreak of the Second Palestinian Intifada and the start of the current rise of global anti-Semitism that followed. Sadly, this period has provided many episodes that serve as painful reminders of the urgency of the problem we continue to face in the struggle against the hatred of the Jewish people and the Jewish state. As we gauge our progress in this battle, we must commit ourselves to sustaining the forward momentum of the global fight for Jewish security. That struggle will take place here in Washington, at the United Nations and its various offices around the world, and in capitals throughout Europe and Latin America and elsewhere. The path forward will undoubtedly be difficult, but B'nai B'rith is mindful of our community's well-being, continues to work for it with great determination and firm commitment. We saw in Alan's speech some of the many, many of the things that we do in this regard. In the words of Theodore Herzl, our opponents maintain that we are confronted with insurmountable political obstacles, but that may be said of the smallest obstacle if one has no desire to surmount. Thank you.